I wanted to get into the handful of teams you think could win the national championship. I thought it was more or less four or five a few weeks ago, but I really think with the with the way the tournament's played out, a lot of the number one seeds knocked off some other teams. Auburn wins the SEC. Michigan State continues to win. What are the number of teams you think that are capable of actually winning the national championship this year? You know, I've got in my final four, and of course, we all know that our brackets get turned upside down. It's why we call it madness. So let's begin with just enjoying the madness as our office pools and, and, and uh, brackets get turned upside down. That's the beautiful aspect of trying to predict what 18 to 22 year olds are going to do under duress uh, with the spotlight of the NCAA tournament now being as great as any sporting event in the world. Um, you know, for my final four, I've got Duke, uh, Kentucky, uh, Gonzaga, and Tennessee. Um, Duke out of the East, Kentucky out of the Midwest, obviously Gonzaga in the West, Tennessee in the South. Uh, but a team like Syracuse, uh, dangerous, that could be a tough matchup in the second round if they punch through and they end up facing Gonzaga, that zone defense, uh, Jim Beheim, no stranger to the tournament, and the adjustments he makes within that zone, whether he collapses it uh, to the basket area like an accordion or he can extend it as well uh, to get out in the passing lanes to trap uh, particular players or based on the clock, time, score, personnel, uh, does a lot of things. It's not a hands-up, hairy, you know, stationary 2-3 zone. Um, it, it morphs. It's a chameleon. And we've seen the success Mike Hopkins has had bringing Jim Beheim zone to the Pac-12. Um, so, you know, would it shock me uh, if a, a team like Gonzaga gets knocked out? No, uh, because they've got some work ahead of them as well. And yet I think overall Gonzaga has the most favorable bracket of the four number one seeds. Speaking of the favorable bracket, I think Michigan State could have qualified as a, as a number one seed. But not only do they not get the number one seed, they beat Michigan three times, they win the Big Ten, and they get stuck as the number two seed, but in the bracket with Duke. Talk to us a, a little bit about that uh, positioning for, for that team and what it looks like for Tom Izzo and that crew. Yeah, it's ironic that probably Michigan – you know, ends up as a two seed uh, in a more favorable region than Michigan State does, uh, who beat them, you know, three consecutive times uh, on their home floor in Ann Arbor and then turned around to close out the Big Ten championship uh, in East Lansing. And then they get them in the conference tournament. <clears throat> so uh, yesterday, I can only think, if I look at that, that maybe the selection committee was considering all these injuries. And again, that's a touch of irony there because uh, as they lost Morgan uh, or Nick Ward, um, you know, even had an injury yesterday, maybe that affected the seeding and the thinking. And so sometimes that's a catch-22. You can be winning games, as Tom Izzo did, but as you have injuries, uh, the selection committee makes it clear they factor that into the seeding. And so maybe they felt that Michigan State of the twos was the least likely uh, to punch through to a Final Four and then and, and adjusted the brackets accordingly. So there's so many variables to this. But uh, Tom Izzo, in my view, did the best coaching job of anyone uh, in the in the high major levels. You know, they're, look at Houston, obviously, with Kelvin Sampson. I think you could build a case for him being – a national coach of the year as well. And, and there are a lot of great candidates. Jay Wright maximizing his personnel with what he lost last year. Four players drafted in the top 33 of the NBA, and he comes back, wins another Big East, and then a Big East tournament championship for the third straight year, first time in 40 years in the Big East that that's happened. So a um, lot of great coaching jobs, but I put Tom Izzo's right up there, and yet I probably didn't get the most favorable seat. So, Steve... Put your coaching hat back on here and pretend you're Tony Bennett. After what happened a year ago, again, a number one seed, how are you approaching uh, the first round here on, on, I don't know if they're going to play Thursday or Friday, but, but how are you approaching it with your team? How are you going about after what, had, what transpired last year? Well, the number one element is those players know and coach – Bennett knows that they lost their best player the week of the NCAA tournament, DeAndre Hunter. And so it'd be the equivalent of the Lakers losing LeBron, you know, for their level relative to college basketball. Or we saw with Duke when Zion Williamson 
went out, the effect that has on their team. And so uh, Virginia already played with a small margin for error last season, uh, partly because their style of play, uh, the deliberate tempo and posing their preferred tempo, which is deliberate, kind of surgical in nature. Uh, this team is better offensively. Uh, they're shooting the ball uh, with the best of them in the country. They cover all of the defensive uh, statistics, number one and two in the country, in every important defensive category. Uh, so I think that team and coach is aware, not that there's the natural uh, you know, anticipation, that kind of palpable uh, you know, desire that you can feel uh, with the team, and I'm sure Coach Bennett's aware they got to punch through that first game. But I don't think they'll focus too much on that. I think the goal of a coach is to keep your team locked in on the task at hand and to keep the drum roll the same. Uh, there's a, a routine and a rhythm we know all athletes, coaches, and teams have, and it's different for each team and each coach. But um, you want to stay with that drum roll, and that doesn't guarantee that you're going to have success, uh, but you're more likely if you can replicate and duplicate. And again, basketball, like life, a game of habits, right, as Aristotle teaches us. And so no better team in terms of basketball fundamentals and of strong habits uh, than Tony Bennett. Tony Bennett's father, Dick Bennett, who grew up in Wisconsin, uh, used to go to Vince Lombardi's practices. And uh, that's where he really developed a, a coaching philosophy, even though it's in basketball as opposed to football, like Lombardi. Uh, when you watch their teams, it's blocking and tackling, it's passing and catching, it's fundamentals, it's jump stops, it's footwork and pivoting, it's hitting the open man with precision right in the shooting pocket. Uh, they're all fundamentally sound in terms of staying on balance, not jumping in the air to make passes, but instead sitting down and pocket passing or fan the ball back out in the perimeter, just being solid, ball security. They never turn it over, always one or two in the country. And so that family tree uh, from Wisconsin, the Dick Bennett's, the Bo Ryan's, uh, the Tony Bennett's, uh, not surprisingly, Gray Guard at Wisconsin, they all have a very similar philosophy. So I don't think they'll be focused on the 116, but instead the task at hand of guarding people uh, and playing a cohesive manner of basketball and defense, creating their offense and, and uh, understanding and playing the game with, with an intelligence. The Rich Eisen Show, weekdays at noon Eastern on Audience.